Welcome to World War I Centennial News, episode number 92. It's about World War I then, what was happening a hundred years ago, and it's about World War I now, news and updates about the centennial and the commemoration. But before we get going, I want to talk to you about our free Bells of Peace app for iPhone and Android. Now, this was its first week out, with hundreds and hundreds of you going to the App Store, searching for Bells of Peace and downloading the app. Well, now it's out there. We're getting some great feedback about what people like most about it. First of all, anyone paying attention to World War I, the free app is a great countdown timer to the centennial of the armistice. Of course, you get to audition and pick from seven different kinds of bells, which I noticed are being used for all sorts of things in manual mode, from stopping and starting meetings to a ship's bell announcing dinner over Alexa at my house. <laughs> but it's actually a lot more than bells. It's an armistice participation app. It has its own news channel where we'll be publishing armistice information like live stream links for 11.11, schedules of events in D.C., major updates from states, and all sorts of armistice special information. But maybe most intriguing, and why I wanted to talk about it this morning before the show, is because it has its own armistice social channel integrated with all the regular ones. What do I mean by that? Well, you can use the app on your phone to post your armistice preparation and events with photos, videos, and text to the entire Centennial community right out of your phone. Your posts from the app, curated by us to make sure that only legitimate posts get on, will appear to all app users and on the national website for the armistice, even if you don't have a social media account. Now, if you do have a social media account, anything that you hashtag with Toll the Bells, hashtag Toll the Bells, will show up in our curation dashboard and we'll post it to the app and to the site. Now, this is an experiment in creating a special interest social media channel for a major national historical event. We hope you'll download the app and join Bells of Peace, the armistice of World War I remembered. In this week's episode... It's the beginning of October, and we have our October Overview Roundtable discussion with Catherine Akey, Dr. Edward Langell, and I. Rob Laplander joins us from France to talk about the Lost Battalion. Mike Schuster updates us on the dizzying October changes 100 years ago. We're joined by Dr. Tom Jackson, Executive Director of the Georgia World War I Centennial Commission. Mark Foster, a citizen historian, tells us about his experience researching his grandfather's World War I service. Dr. Eric Villard from the Center of Military History introduces us to the Army's incredible World War I website. It's really more than a website, it's a resource. We're going to learn about a new upcoming documentary about the Lost Battalion from the filmmakers who created it. And The Buzz, where Catherine Akey highlights some World War I centennial posts and stories from social media. All this week on World War I Centennial News, which is brought to you by the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, and the Star Foundation. I'm Teo Mayer, the Chief Technologist for the Commission and your host. Welcome to the show. How do you even do an overview of October 1918? Well, that was the question on the table as Dr. Edward Langle, Catherine Akey, and I got together for our popular monthly overview roundtable of what happened 100 years ago. What follows is our conversation. Ed, starting with you. What's the overarching theme in October? The cracking of the Hindenburg Line, which is the final German line of defense on the Western Front. This is the month that marks the final defeat of the German army in the field. And it's interesting, of course, later on, the Germans are going to deny that their army was ever really defeated. They're going to claim that it's revolutions at home that ended the war. But in fact, they're heavily defeated on the Western Front this month. And this is also the month that marks the collapse of the Central Powers as a coalition. 
they begin to fall apart, both militarily, but also diplomatically. And this is the beginning of the end. It's clear by this point that the war is going to end in 1918. Well, the big event that everybody's focused on is the Battle of the Meuse-Argonne. What's the story there? The Meuse-Argonne offensive continues to slog forward for the first two weeks of October and reaches a crescendo around October 14th, 15th, 16th as American forces crack the central German strongpoint in the Meuse-Argonne at a place called the Heights of Kunel and Rahman. Douglas MacArthur is involved in this action. He claims that he's the guy who found the gap in the German wire that allowed the final German strongpoint to be broken. But coincidentally, all of the other soldiers who would have witnessed MacArthur finding the gap were killed. So MacArthur said that he led a scouting party toward the wire and that during a bombardment, all of his fellow scouts were killed and only he survived and that he brought the word back of the gap in the wire. Whether that's true or not, and we don't know, the American forces are able to break through. But the important thing to remember is the first two weeks of October in the Meuse-Argonne, as well as elsewhere, experience very heavy fighting, high casualty rates. This is the month in which Charles Whittlesey and George McMurtry of the leaders of the Lost Battalion, the 77th Division, are surrounded and almost wiped out. So there continues to be very heavy fighting. Catherine, you mentioned that there are actually actions going on all over the place, and we shouldn't just concentrate on what happened in the Meuse-Argonne. Yeah, I mean, of course, we want to have a focus on the Americans and what the American forces were tied up in. But it's important to remember that the Belgians, the French, the British, and their imperial armies, they're all still fighting on the Western Front. And they have a lot of successes this month. Um, The Fifth Battle of Ypres, the Battle of the Canal du Nord, Saint-Quentin Canal, Battle of Cambrai, Battle of Courtrai, lots of battles going on. And the real theme of all of these is that the Allies are gaining kilometers, miles and miles with each push, which for years of this war was basically unheard of. You did not move very far. They're capturing thousands of German prisoners, sometimes tens of thousands of German prisoners in a matter of days, hundreds of their guns, and they're recapturing towns and cities that are strategic like Ostend or Douai or Zeebrugge, some of these towns that are on the coast or have railheads in them. And they're rolling up and punching through the Hindenburg line and just sort of getting rid of all the German reinforcements and all the German defenses that have been protected up to this point just by being at the very back of the fighting. Now, the British are also wrapping things up in the Middle East, aren't they? Yes, there's a lot of action in the Middle East. Last month, we were talking a lot about the Battle of Megiddo. That technically ends on October 1st, when the British Desert Mounted Corps, a cavalry unit, captures Damascus. The battle was a complete loss for the Ottoman Empire, who starts a not-so-strategic retreat, basically getting as out of dodge as they can, as fast as they can. And the British chase after them, something known as the pursuit to Heritan. They chase these retreating Ottoman forces back through Lebanon all the way to Syria, where eventually they catch up with them. And at the end of the month, the conflict ends between the Ottoman Empire and the Allies, and they sign a peace treaty with the Allied forces. Prince Faisal, the leader of the Arab rebellion, leads his forces into Damascus, And that whole saga of the Arab uprising sort of comes to a a close. French forces are active in the Middle East as well, and they capture Beirut in October. And British and other forces are advancing through Mesopotamia at the same time. In one interesting episode, one well-known American, namely Kermit Roosevelt, son of Theodore Roosevelt, is active in Mesopotamia at this time driving Rolls-Royce armored cars around what would later become Iraq, embedded with British forces. Ed, there's a big change in the war on the seas. Could you talk about that? After all the drama that brought the United States into the war in the first place and the resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare early in 1917, the Germans suspend submarine warfare in October of 1918, essentially bringing the war on the seas to a close. 
the German surface fleet has been holed up in its ports on the North Sea and the Baltic for the past couple of years. And the German sailors are rapidly approaching the point of an all-out mutiny. Some of their officers have been proposing the idea that they take the entire German fleet out for one last suicide attack on the British in the North Sea. And this quickly becomes clear that the German sailors will never accept that. And their mood is rapidly becoming mutinous. And we'll find the results of that next month. Speaking of mutinous, there are sort of revolutions building, and in fact, partly the German government claims that that is what ended the war, right? Yeah, the blockade of Germany has really taken hold by this point. The German civilians are suffering a great deal. We're seeing revolutionary feelings spreading across Central Europe, which will erupt toward the end of October in Vienna and Budapest but is rapidly approaching in Germany as well. Hey, Catherine, there are some things going on in the war in the sky that sort of point to the future of air warfare. The first is, over the course of October, the U.S. Army Signal Corps is starting to experiment with something called the Kettering Bug. It's an unmanned aircraft, effectively a drone is sort of the term we would use for it today. It doesn't do so well on its first few test flights, but it does eventually work successfully, but not in time to be used during the war. It's just another little signal of the kinds of aerial warfare we'll see later in the 20th century. Additionally, the first all U.S. Marine Corps air combat action takes place on October 14th when eight Airco aircraft go and bomb a German-held town in Belgium. Additionally, my favorite air story from this month circles around Belgian flying ace Willie Coppins. Willie Coppins is known as the best balloon buster of the war. He liked to target those observation balloons, firing on them and blowing them up. The U.S. ace in that is a guy named Frank Luke, but this is a Belgian ace. This is a Belgian ace, and he's actually got a better score than Frank Luke altogether, having shot down 34 observation balloons over the course of the war. So the Germans know him. He's been bothering them and shooting down their balloons for months at this point. So they decide to lure him into a trap by loading an observation balloon basket with explosives. And then as he went to shoot down the balloon, it would blow up with a lot of energy and take him down with it. But instead of that, he actually just flies right through the explosion and emerges unharmed. There's a lot of stuff that happens in terms of the reformation of Europe and Eastern Europe and the formation of countries and the Balkans that appear and disappear. People aren't necessarily fighting the Germans or the Americans or the French. They're all sort of in a giant cauldron. What was that all about? It's almost a situation of chaos in Eastern Europe. We see the rise of new nations, of the independent Czechoslovakia, of Yugoslavia, of Poland, and the Polish army, which is fighting both against the Germans and the Russians, is recognized as a co-belligerent power. But as Austria-Hungary begins to spin into disarray, the Hungarians are battling with other nationalities in the Balkans, and especially the Romanians and many others. A number of small republics appear and disappear. As the Balkans are convulsing and (laughs) shifting, there's still fighting going on in Italy on the Italian front, up really high in the part of the Alps known as the Dolomites. This last battle in that front, the Battle of Vittorio Veneto, is a major Italian assault on Austro-Hungarian positions. One year after that really disastrous Battle of Caporetto, where the Italians lost handily, the assault was really intense. They fired over two and a half million shells in the course of a week. That's over 350,000 shells per day, a lot of artillery fire. Ultimately, Austro-Hungary is badly, badly beaten, and they actually order a general retreat from all positions in Northern Italy. So their forces are officially pulling completely out of that fighting front at the end of October. As we record this, we're 39 days from armistice, right? So armistice doesn't just happen. 
This month has to be the sort of countdown process for getting there. Would one or both of you sort of run down what some of the events are that eventually create an armistice on the 11th of November? The German and Austro-Hungarian governments have recognized by the beginning of October that they're going to have to ask for an armistice and that the war is going to need to end this month. So on October 4th, they began the process of sending notes to President Woodrow Wilson, who, because of the 14 points, they view him as the friendliest of the Allied leaders. They send notes to him proposing an armistice. Wilson then replies to them demanding that they evacuate the occupied territories. When they accept those terms, he then ramps up the terms and requires a number of other things, including that the Allies will only negotiate with a democratic German government, which of course leads to increased political turmoil in Germany and the other countries. Out with the Kaiser is what he's saying. He's saying out with the Kaiser, but also uh, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, who have been governing more or less as dictators in Germany through 1918. And this ends with uh, Ludendorff's resignation on October 27th. So he's gone, and clearly the Kaiser is going to follow him pretty soon. But the Austro-Hungarians, the Turks, the Bulgarians are not going to wait for the Germans to come to terms with an armistice. The Germans are still fighting as hard as they can. So the Turks actually withdraw from the war at the end of October, and the Austro-Hungarians are in the process of withdrawing from the war by that time as well. You know, our first action in the war and the beginning of the turnaround was actually uh, at San Mihal. And that feels like it was just yesterday, and here we are in a month when it's actually looking like it's wrapping up. And that creates almost a false impression that the Germans were already defeated when the Americans came in, that they were on the run, that there was no serious fighting going on. But this takes a good four to six weeks from San Miguel up through the climax of the Misargonne in mid-October of very hard, very heavy fighting before we reach the point that the Germans finally break. We have other important battles in which Americans are involved, uh, Blancmont and the Champagne region in which the Marines are involved. The African-American 93rd Division is involved in very heavy fighting in this period. So it's building up in October to a climax and then a very sudden collapse of the German forces. I would also mention it's very easy for us to throw out all these battle names and talk about how much ground they're covering and what towns they recapture. But every single one of these battles, these multi-day, multi-week battles is 30,000 casualties or 12,000 casualties. It's thousands of humans are losing their lives to make this happen, to move this war forward towards an end. The fighting and the dying, the scale of it is not going down. It's just continuing. We're just, quote unquote, making progress. I've sort of been trying to wrap my head around the speed of events. It's just sort of staggering. Yeah, it's partly fog of war, but it's also a perception on the part of the Allies, and especially the Americans, that they just have to keep pounding and pounding and pounding the Germans without let up. If anything, they even have to accelerate the rate of attack around now so that the Germans don't get any time to relax, that we really push them into a complete capitulation. That's one reason in some ways that the casualty levels practically rise through this period. As a wrap-up, what would be the two phrases that you would summarize October 1918 with? Defeat of the German army in the field and the beginning of the armistice negotiations. I have one, too. It's almost unfathomable how much is going on. Catherine, what about you? I would say it feels like we're at the climax, but we're actually in the falling action of the war. And again, this is informed by our being able to look back with the hindsight of history. It's incredibly busy. Things are changing very fast. But we're not at the climax of this war. We're at that sort of falling action, 
not really falling into a proper denouement because the war just comes to a crashing, crashing stop in November. But we're, we're sort of on a very slippery, fast moving downward slope towards that finish. There are really two fabled stories in American World War I lore. Interestingly, they both surround the first few weeks of October. One is the story of Sergeant Alvin York, the other the story of the Lost Battalion. Both became larger than life, spun up by popular media and the desire to turn the war into adventure and saga. But the real story, the actual events, are probably more dramatic more human, more emotional, and certainly more painful than the fictionalized ones. What they share in common is the humility, valor, willing sacrifice, and character of some remarkable Americans, ordinary men in extraordinary circumstance. We're joined by Rob Laplander, citizen historian and author of Finding the Lost Battalion, Beyond the Rumors, Myths, and Legends of America's Famous World War I Epic. Rob, welcome back to the podcast. How are you there, sir? Good. Hey, Rob, you're coming in all the way from France. Yes, sir. We are just outside of Bienerville, France, where the Lost Battalion was trapped for five days on a hillside in the Charlevoix Ravine. We are just about three kilometers away. I'd like to be doing this from in the pocket, but there's no cell coverage there. Sorry. <laughs> well, I'm not surprised. It's a bit remote. Rob, to start with, who is the Lost Battalion, and how did they wind up getting lost? The Lost Battalion is actually a group of about 700 men who were trapped a kilometer and a half ahead of enemy lines for five days between October 2nd and October 7th, 1918. If this were the 20s or 30s, you'd know all about it. It was a very popular story at the time. About 700 men went into the ravine, and at the end of the five-day siege, 194 walked out. They took 72% casualties, and it was one of the most overreported stories of the war. The most significant thing about it, I think, is that Lost Battalion is a misnomer. They weren't lost in the sense that nobody knew where they were. Everybody knew where they were. Even the guys would tell you, hell, everybody knew where we were. Even the Germans knew where we were. Lost meant that they were in a situation that it didn't look like they were going to get out of. So, Rob, your book, The Lost Battalion, is actually titled Finding the Lost Battalion Beyond the Rumors, Myths, Legends of America's Famous World War I Epic. And that begs the question, what are the myths and misconceptions about the epic? There's always been this misconception that the leader of the Lost Battalion, Charles Whittlesey, had them in the wrong spot, or that he charged ahead in some moment of glory and put them in a situation that was untenable. Neither one of those stories is true. Whittlesey was exactly where he said he was, and he was given specific and direct orders, and he followed them And when nobody else did. Another myth is that he sent out the wrong coordinates from where he was, which led to an American artillery barrage directly down on their position. And that's not true at all. There were several different factors that were involved in how that happened, but it had absolutely nothing to do with Charles Whittlesey. But there was a barrage that came down on them? Yes. On October 4th, for a period of time, there was an American barrage that landed directly on the position. They had to endure it for almost two and a half hours. How did they wind up getting found? Whittlesey and his men sat on that hillside for five days. And in the meantime, the rest of the regiment and their sister regiment, the 307th, fought very hard to get them out, to get over the hill and into that ravine so that they could link up with their flanks. And it helped pry the line loose so that the Germans had no choice but to actually pull out. It was about 7.30 p.m. on October 7th that the Germans evacuated the area and Company B of the 307th managed to come in on the right flank and hook up with Whittlesey. By that time, however, the damage had been done. Only 194 were able to walk out under their own power. Now, they tried to resupply Whittlesey by air, and we had a story about that last week. What was that about? The 50th Air Squadron tried very hard to come in into the ravine and drop packages. The problem was Whittlesey's men were dug in so deep 
if they could be seen from the air, then they could be seen from the hills around them. And if they were seen from the hills around them, they'd be killed. When they finally came out, there were already cameras and reporters all set up, and it got turned into kind of a media story, didn't it? Well, even before they were out of the pocket, as early as October 5th, the first newspaper articles were appearing in newspapers at home about them. They were already heroes, even before they were out of the pocket. And when they walked out of the position on October 8th, there was cameras there and reporters, and there's actually film footage that was taken of them coming out. Well, Rob, you're there now. What's it like walking the space on the centennial of the event? We were here 10 years ago for the 90th, and it was a very moving experience then. Now being here on the hillside each day that they were there, 100 years to the minute that they were there, this is a story that I've lived with for the better part of 21 or 22 years. My kids know the story. My wife knows the story. You can't swing a dead cat in my house without hitting something lost battalion. And here we are at the 100th anniversary on this hillside. It's an extremely moving thing to be part of the centennial of World War I to begin with. And now to be allowed to be part of this, to have this honor of standing on this hillside in the foxholes that they were in 100 years ago and to know what happened here. It defies description in a way, and it's very, very moving. Rob Laplander is an author, citizen historian, and importantly, the force behind the Doughboy MIA project, which tracks all of the still-missing U.S. service personnel from the war. We have links to both his book and the Doughboy MIA site in the podcast notes. Now, as we discussed in the roundtable, the wheels of change are spinning at a dizzying rate. But not for the men with their boots on the ground. Fighting is fierce. Losses are horrific as the national leaderships begin to face the reality that the war must end. Wilson's insistence that he will not negotiate terms with the Kaiser or his military regime has a profound effect. Here, with a great overview of these tectonic shifts in geopolitical terms, is Mike Schuster, former NPR correspondent and curator for the Great War Project blog. Mike, how would you characterize this moment in the war? Theo, I think we might say fateful would be a good word. So the headline reads, Generals to the Kaiser, the war cannot go on. Talk of an armistice, Bulgaria in turmoil, but fighting is still ferocious, special to the Great War Project. A century ago, one by one and day by day, Germany and its allies are crumbling. On September 27th, more than 23,000 German prisoners had been taken reports historian Martin Gilbert. Elsewhere, on the front line of the Western Front, a six-hour artillery bombardment with more than 700 Allied tanks in action. By then, more than 1,000 aircraft have joined the fight, supporting the Allied effort with more than 700 tons of bombs dropped. By nightfall, writes Gilbert, the attacking forces had taken 10,000 prisoners and 200 guns. Even by the standards of the Western Front, the scale of the German losses is astounding. 33,000 prisoners in one day. The British launched another massive offensive on September 28th at Ypres, the third attack to break the German hold there. 500 aircraft are in the sky. Belgian troops are also in action that day, recapturing Passchendaele, which had been lost a year earlier, the scene of such terrible slaughter, writes historian Gilbert. On the Salonika front in mountainous Greece, more than 10,000 Bulgarian and German soldiers are taken prisoner in the third week of September. Then a significant move to end the fighting. On September 28th, writes Gilbert, Bulgaria, with British and Greek troops already on her soil, began armistice talks with the French and British in Salonika. They are the first to succeed in calling off the fight. Top German political leaders then weigh in. They tell the German Kaiser that Germany must join the armistice talks. They tell the Kaiser on September 29th that the war cannot go on. Why? According to historian Martin Gilbert, Germany's top two military leaders tell the Kaiser this is not about the will and ability of the German soldier to fight. No, it is also President Wilson's deep reluctance to negotiate in any way with the Kaiser himself or his military chiefs. So, Gilbert reports, the Kaiser signs a proclamation establishing a parliamentary regime. 
In the space of a single day, Germany's militarism and autocracy were all but over. But the battles continued, nowhere more fiercely than on the Meuse-Argonne front. On September 29th, the fourth day of the battle, American forces were brought to a halt partly by the unflagging German defense, partly by the incredible chaos that had developed in their lines of supply and communication. Observes one visitor to Commanding General Pershing at the French front, his soldiers were dying bravely, but they were not advancing or very little, and their losses were very heavy. All that great body of men, which the American army represented, was literally struck with paralysis. Then hostilities on the Bulgarian front, reports Gilbert, ended at noon on September 30th. That leaves Bulgaria in turmoil and with no chance of Germany providing reinforcements. The Bulgarian collapse was a blow to Germany and Austria, both of which were suddenly cut off from all land links with their ally, Turkey. At the beginning of October, a century ago, the situation looks dire for Germany, but fighting is ferocious nevertheless. And that's news from the Great War Project this week, a century ago. Mike Schuster is the curator for the Great War Project blog. The link to his post is in the podcast notes. That's it for 100 years ago. Let's jump back into the present with World War I Centennial News Now. Now, this part of the podcast focuses on now, the centennial commemoration of the events of World War I, and of course, the upcoming centennial of the armistice. This week in Commission News. State centennial organizations and the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission gathered in Chicago last week for an event we called To Honor and Remember. The event was graciously hosted by the Commission's founding sponsor, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. It was a wonderful event, with Colonel Pritzker warmly welcoming everybody to the museum's historic site. There was a keynote by Colonel Gerard York, the grandson of Sergeant Alvin York followed by a panel on how we're going to archive the incredible work that has been accomplished over the past several years by the Commission, the states, and individuals in commemorating World War I. There were lots of other events and thank yous to all who've dedicated so much over the past years to the centennial. We have links to the event video for you in the podcast notes. Update on Bells of Peace, the national tolling for the armistice. It's really taking off. States, cities, and hundreds of individuals are pledging to participate. Two notable additions this last week. The Secretary of the Navy issued an all-nav bulletin, 072-18. Here's an excerpt. Quote, The U.S. Navy and U.S. Marine Corps will participate in this event. Commander's intent, A, purpose, recognize the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. B, method, Execute a global recognition of Armistice Day through a coordinated Department of the Navy-wide bell-ringing ceremony on Sunday, 11 November at 1100. Toll your bells 21 times with a five-second interval between each toll. Groups that do not have bells can render the salute by other available means. Now, we also got word late last week that the Washington Capitol Dome is going to toll its bell. We're pretty excited about what's happening. We're nearly up to 30 state proclamations and we're gunning for 50. We launched a new campaign for cities and counties to do proclamations just starting last week. And this coming week, we're going to cross our first 1,000 individuals signing up to participate using the app. Join them by searching for Bells of Peace in your app store. This week, in our updates from the states, we're heading to the state that was home to two U.S. presidents directly involved in World War I, the state of Georgia. Woodrow Wilson's boyhood home was in Augusta, and the era's U.S. Assistant Secretary of the Navy and future president Franklin D. Roosevelt built his famous Little White House at Warm Springs, Georgia. In 1945, it's also where he died. So, to learn more about Georgia in World War I, we're joined by Dr. Tom Jackson, Executive Director of the Georgia World War I Centennial Commission and retired Vice President for Public Affairs at the University of Georgia. Tom, it's wonderful to have you on the show. Hello, Teo. Thank you for the opportunity. Tom, Georgia was an early entrant into the state World War I commemoration. Could you tell our audience a little bit about how Georgia and the Georgia Commission got started in all this? 
Well, Teo, we had a prime mover in the form of Dr. Monique Seafried, who's one of your National Centennial Commission commissioners. Dr. Seafried influenced the governor of Georgia, who is her neighbor, and uh, the Georgia legislature to adopt and create a Georgia World War I Centennial Commission in its 2015 session. Two commissioners appointed by the governor, two by the lieutenant governor, and two by the Speaker of the House gathered in late 2015, and we have been at work ever since. And a story I didn't know. You know, your team's done a stellar job in uncovering telling the story of Georgia in World War I. Could you tell us a bit about Georgia during 1916 through 19? Well, Georgians shared America's isolationist attitudes at that time, and the state had a particular economic pinch as exports of cotton, tobacco, timber, and naval stores to the markets in Germany and Austria-Hungary were stopped by the British naval blockade of Europe. But when the U.S. entry into the war came in April 1917, patriotic fervor swept Georgia. Ultimately, more than a half million men were registered for the draft in Georgia. More than 100,000 men and women served in military or support roles. And many of the Americans who fought in the European theater, as many as half who went overseas, came through Georgia camp. And these included places like Fort McPherson in Atlanta, Fort Oglethorpe near Chattanooga in Georgia, and Fort Screbin on Tybee Island. There were war training camps, Camp Gordon in Chambly, Camp Hancock in Augusta, Camp Wheeler in Macon, among others. Flight school at Souther Field in Americus trained almost 2,000 military pilots for combat over France. Charles Lindbergh took his first flight at Souther Field. And near war's end, Columbus was chosen to house the Army's School of Arms, leading to construction of Fort Benning, today the nation's leading center for infantry training and ground maneuvers. And of course, infantry and armor make up the Fort Benning Maneuver Center as an enduring legacy of World War I in Georgia. And it's particularly difficult to determine precisely how many Georgians died in World War I. Unfortunately, the memorial records of the day listed only the white soldiers. The primary efforts of our commission here in Georgia has been to identify all Georgians who died in service in the war, and it revealed a large number of black soldiers, at the latest count, 1,228, who made the ultimate sacrifice, and it brings the total number of Georgians who died in uniform, 3,700, and we hope to honor them all in this centennial observance. Well, Tom, members of your commission literally went from county courthouse to county courthouse, re-recording the names on the local memorials to help build that list, didn't they? They did. In particular, Dr. Lamar Veach, who's the retired state librarian, has been our prime mover in that. He's been all over Georgia. There are 159 counties. I think he's been in every one. The listeners can go to our website and see this photographic database of all of these monuments. They're quite colorful. They're quite varied. It's an interesting tour through the state and through the way that local people were commemorating the war at the time. So what do you think is the most important thing that resulted from your team and your commission's efforts? I would say the most important thing is that commemoration of the African-American service in the war, the identification of 1,228 people who had not previously properly been memorialized. But we've had many other things that we've done. We had a grant through to the Georgia Department of Education to support development of World War I curriculum to be integrated into the history courses in fifth, sixth, and eighth grades and in high school because, as you might suspect, World War I sometimes gets short shrift in the history courses. We had a statewide History Day program in conjunction with the Georgia Humanities Council that awarded two top winners in World War I-themed projects with trips to Washington, D.C. for this November's events, and the summer one went to France for centennial events there, a grand prize. The website is a legacy of the commission in its own right, with the memorial sites around the state, a history, an updated listing of all Georgians who died. The names are there by county and can be searched. We've had exhibits at many places around the state, the Atlanta History Center, the Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport, erected a state historical marker commemorating the tragic loss of Georgians' lives in the wreck of the troop ship Otranto off of Ireland right before the end of the war, the worst troop ship disaster during the war. We're erecting a sculpture of the first African-American military aviator, Georgia native, Eugene Bullard a native of Columbus, Georgia. This will be located at the U.S. Air Force Museum of Aviation at Warner Robins, if all the technical aspects can be worked out of that. But Ballard was never allowed to fly for the U.S. He had to fly for France because he was an African-American. 
worked with the Georgia Department of Transportation to plant memorial poppies along the Molina Michael Highway, which is the highway between Atlanta and Athens, in honor of Ms. Michael's role in development of the Buddy Poppy to support veterans. She was a faculty member at the University of Georgia and the prime mover behind the idea of the Buddy Poppy. And we helped encourage and promote local centennial events all around the state. And our thanks to museums and local communities who have done lectures and performances and seminars throughout the past four years. You've really had an amazing program. What are the plans for the armistice? And also, the other question I wanted to ask you is, what happens after the armistice? Well, we have a large program, a formal state observance planned for the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, coming up on Sunday, November 11th, at the Atlanta History Center. It will be the state observance. It will open with patriotic music, followed by participation in the bells of peace, ringing precisely at 11, and then some appropriate remarks. After, actually, the way the legislation was set up that got us off to such an early start, perhaps gets us to an early end as well. We expired July of 2019. But our main remaining project is to complete the statue of aviator Eugene Bullard and to have it erected and dedicated. And we would hope to do that during Black History Month this coming February, and if not, certainly before July. Dr. Tom Jackson, Executive Director of the Georgia World War I Centennial Commission. Learn more about the Commission and the Centennial of World War I in Georgia by visiting the links in the podcast notes. This week, in our segment on remembering veterans, we're joined by the grandson of a World War I veteran whose story of uncovering his family's heritage is pretty inspirational. Mark Foster knew next to nothing about his grandfather, John Foster, except that he was buried at Arlington National Cemetery. But as he started to go through his family's heirlooms, letters, photographs, and newspaper articles, he began a journey of discovery about his grandfather. Mark, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Good morning, Tail. Thank you for having me. So, Mark, this voyage of discovery, what launched it, and how did you begin to uncover your grandfather's story of service in World War I? I had found a box of my father's memories, and going through it, actually, it was headed to the garbage. I was cleaning out the basement. Yeah, I better take a look at these things. And next thing you know, I start going through. I find letters from my grandfather from the front. I found the letter from his commanding officer to our family that he had passed. And then, of course, the one that started all this trouble is an article that I found from 1936 regarding a changing of the headstone. At that point, I was starting my family tree, and I figured we had no pictures of my grandfather. I figured a picture of the headstone would be a nice addition to the family tree. So I requested one, and the article from changing the headstone, it was mismarked at Arlington, where he was from Kansas. And at that point, I ordered that picture, and sure as heck, it was still Kansas. Now, that got me kind of fired up. I wrote every state legislator. I wrote the local paper. And two people responded, Congressman Jesse Jackson and the Journal Register in Springfield. Reporter Dave Bakke, interested in the story. Next thing you know, the ball is rolling. I get a phone call from Arlington National Cemetery that, yeah, all we need is a letter from the family requesting a change in the headstone, which I did. At that point, I had advised Dave Bakke. He says, you know, Mark, this sounds interesting. I think I'm going to do an article. It ended up on the front page of the Journal Register, headstone to change 93 years later. I was familiar with the First Division Museum in Wheaton, Illinois, and I had thought maybe they might be interested in this because John was a member of the First Division. Sent this off to them, and two weeks later, I get a letter that John Chester may be eligible for the Silver Star. (laughs) Once again, I started writing letters. Next thing you know, I get a very impressive letter from the Awards and Decorations branch in Fort Knox that, yes, in fact, he was eligible for the Silver Star. And that's pretty much my story there. That's quite a story. So you publish your findings on the Commission Story of Service catalog. 
which is going to preserve that story and your grandfather's service for posterity. How did you find the stories of service, and what was it like submitting it? Well, (laughs) my wife goes nuts with me. I will spend pretty much an hour every single day looking into the World War I. Hit Google, hit anything that is related to my grandfather. Well, one day, the commission website came up. And the more I delve into it, I found the story. You know, they might be interested in this story. But as lengthy as it was, I was concerned it would be chopped to shreds, and it was not. They accepted it fully, and I sent copies of the link to all my relatives nationwide, and they are just thrilled that it is now saved for posterity. Many people know that their ancestors served, but don't know the story. So what advice would you give to others who want to uncover their own family's heritage the way you did? Oh, gosh, again, patience. Maybe with a little dedication to boot. (laughs) Exactly. Sit there and you find a link, follow the link. I've just really started with the commission website. I know generally where my grandfather was killed. I've been trying to Google Earth it, and the idea that I can punch in a website and hear the Google Earth will show up is thrilling to me. It's become a mission for me. Well, it's really a delight to talk to you, and congratulations on having done this. Well, thank you, and I sure do appreciate the opportunity to speak about my efforts. Mark Foster is the grandson of World War I veteran John Foster. Learn more about his grandfather at the links in the podcast notes. Now, you can also preserve your own ancestor story, making it a permanent part of the national record. By using the Commission's Stories of Service website, you'll find it at www.cc.org slash stories. And to help you get going with that story of service for your family, we suggest that you listen to our interview with Deborah Dudek in our podcast episode number 80. Deborah Dudek is the author of a great, simple, and short book called The World War I Genealogy Research Guide, Tracing American Military and Non-Combatant Ancestors. Now, it may not be the catchiest of titles, but it really describes the book, which is available in print and as an ebook on Amazon.com. Now, I bought a copy on Amazon, and I was so impressed that I sent one to our executive director as well. I'm excited about our next guest because of the organization that he represents. For our Remembering Veterans segment, we're joined by the digital historian for the U.S. Army Center for Military History, Dr. Eric Villard. Dr. Villard has been on point for the Army's World War I commemoration website. Eric, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. So, Eric, the U.S. Army Center for Military History, the CMH, has had its own history tracing back to the Civil War. Your primary responsibility is to be a historical resource to the Army itself, right? Right. That is our principal mission. We provide the historical information that the Army staff and the various Army organizations would need for their institutional education and memory. We also have a secondary but important role in providing this information to the public and to the veteran community as well. So we are able to accomplish both missions, I think, quite seamlessly because when we do this work for the Army and making sure we are the agency that gets the information correct for the Army decision-making process, it's also that high standards of scholarship is something that we can share with the public. Eric, what's the idea for the public-facing site? Well, we have a multi-pronged commemoration effort for the First World War. The website, it's a World War I subsite that is divided into 30 chapters. Each chapter comes out on a monthly basis. And so the first part of the website traces the evolution of the Army in the period before 1917. And then the meat of the website talks about the experience of the AEF in World War I, and then the concluding chapters talk about what happens after the armistice. It's really comprehensive. You really worked hard at that, and you did a great job. So what's the visitor experience like when you get there? Well, I designed the interface like a multifunction display. 
It's a type of device. It's used in a lot of military vehicles where you basically have a central screen and then you have option buttons on the side and bottom. So depending on where you want to go, what you want to look at, those option buttons may change. All the material is grouped together on paper-sized documents. And the advantage of that is when you download it, all the photos and text and everything else stays together. So it's a very easy way to view and share the material. And so I think there's something for everyone. It's designed to be downloaded. So it's great for educators. You can just download entire lessons as JPEGs, PowerPoint, or PDF. Just a whole range of material, again, that really is optimized for educators. Well, Eric, what happened from 1917 to 1919 to the organization called the U.S. Army? There's no precedent in history for that kind of expansion and growth. Can you talk about that just for a moment? I think it's fair to say that the modern United States Army was born in the First World War. The army that we have with us today owes much of its organization to the First World War. It was also a period of great technological change. For example, you have aerial photography, which really revolutionized the fighting in World War I because you now had the ability to send a plane above, take very detailed photographs of enemy trenches and artillery emplacements, and then provide that information to your commanders. It really gave commanders a kind of situational awareness that we take for granted now, you know, with all our satellite imagery and cell phones. So I'm releasing these files so that you can get a sense of the scale and complexity of these battles in Google Earth on your own computer. Eric, one last question. This is for you personally. For everyone who's sort of fallen into this and dug into it, it's a voyage of discovery. What's the most memorable thing you learned from pulling all this together? It's been a remarkable opportunity for me because I, by background, I am a Vietnam War historian. Now, I had done some work with the First World War. I actually wrote my dissertation on Camp Lewis, which was a training camp in Washington State. But I hadn't done a lot with World War I, so it gave me a chance to really dive deep. And I think the thing that impressed me the most is the photographic record. You realize that if you look at these photos, at these individuals, they don't seem like they're distant history. They seem like they could be us. And I think that's the most striking thing, even though a century seems like a long time. When you look at this stuff, you realize, now it's still very much with us. Dr. Eric Villard is the digital historian at the U.S. Army Center for Military History. Learn more about the center and see their really compelling website by visiting the links in the podcast notes. You can also direct tweet a link request to at the WW1 podcast. That's at T-H-E-W-W, the number one podcast. Now, during our history segment, we dug into the story of the Lost Battalion. And for our spotlight on the media, we're going to take a deeper dive into the story, starting with our regular podcast contributor, Dr. Edward Lengel. His new book is called Never in Finer Company, The Men of the Great War's Lost Battalion. Recently, Ed and film historian Anjali Singh appeared on C-SPAN Real America. Here's a clip. And up next, we will show you in its entirety a silent film from 1919. But first, to explain this film, Edward Lengel, who is the author of the new book, Never in Finer Company. We thank you for joining us on American History TV. And Anjali Singh, who is a historian of silent films. Let me begin with your interest in The Lost Battalion. Where does it come from and why? It's the most powerfully human story of the entire First World War and the most powerfully human story I've read in American military history. It's, it's very intimate. It's about a small group of individuals who came from very different backgrounds, many of them from deep poverty, many of them were immigrants, uh, some of them had not even been naturalized, others were farmers and ranchers from the West who came together and endured a common struggle and they bonded together and they became part of the American story. And I've walked on the site of the battlefield itself, which you can still do today. You can see the rifle pits, the, the trenches that the soldiers dug there in the woods, and you can get an intense sense of what they experienced. Ed is also one of the key interviews in a new documentary about the Lost Battalion. <laughs> 
Charles Whittlesey remains an enigma. I don't think he really wanted anybody to know him deep down. He was a very complicated individual. He's haunted by a sense of responsibility for every single man who died in that pocket. Ultimately, he carries the burden of every death on himself, and they begin to appear in his dreams. In one dream, he is carried back to a moment in the pocket where, for one brief moment, he fell asleep. One brief moment, only to wake up cheek to cheek with a dead man that comes back to him in his dreams, and he can't sleep. That clip is from the new documentary titled The Lost Battalion, produced by Mark Fastozo, John King, and Louis Blandon. Now, best of all, Mark and John are with us here today to talk about it. So, gentlemen, The Lost Battalion is one of the better-known sagas in the First World War. What inspired you guys to tell the story as a documentary? I was talking to Ed Langell about his book, and we were musing about what this would be as a documentary if we were going to do that. And he said the magic words to me, you know, there's film footage of the Lost Battalion from the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. And as a filmmaker, you kind of always want to hear that. And sure enough, there were cameras that filmed them marching out of the woods after they were relieved. And I thought, wow, all this footage we have of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, how many can we tie to an actual unit? We found out, you know, Damon Runyon, the great sports reporter, was right there live, and he interviewed and he wrote about that. And that footage and that story, that inspired me to say, hey, there's something here to document. You can look at these men in the eye. And when I thought about that footage of them coming out, immediately I said, why did they film it? It's not combat, it's just guys marching. And all those together started to think this is a really layered story. Immediately, I just said, I think we should do this because this footage allows people to start to connect and relate. It's a real thing, it's the real people. And I thought it was just super compelling. For your documentary, you went out and you interviewed a real who's who lineup of experts, including Ed Lingle. So what was the thing that each of you learned that really sticks out for you after going through all that? Let me start with you, Mark. Well, what I learned is why do we even know about the Lost Battalion? How many battalions fought in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive? This is the only one people kind of know about. And that became really what I was interested in finding out. And what I discovered is that Charles Whittlesey and the Lost Battalion, their story is totally entwined with the story of Damon Runyon and the newspapers. Damon Runyon was tasked to go to the Meuse-Argonne and send back stories of New Yorkers to make the people at home feel good. And he met Charles Whittlesey for probably 15 minutes. And that's why we know about the Lost Battalion. So it's really a story about how America wants heroes, how they create heroes, what the media does, and what that does to the men who have to take on the mantle of being heroes. John, as you got into this, what was the thing that struck you the most? One of the things that really stayed with me is this issue of the interaction of storytelling and real history or history in the media. Because, of course, now we see in our country, the media is sometimes part of the story and the media is helping create the story at the same time. And it's really fascinating that this is a story where that same dynamic was happening, that something was happening, you know, reality was happening, the battle was happening. The media, through Damon Runyon and others, ended up telling the story, but also constructing history. Some of your listeners, I'm sure, know about the go to hell Whittlesey comment. And the idea that some of these famous phrases or a famous phrase in American history is really partly a social construction or a media and social construction, that was really powerful and is powerful to me. And that's one of the storylines of our film. I really like the angle that you're going for. And it actually leads directly into conversations that Catherine Aiken and I have had. Catherine's my cohort and the show is line producer. And she's got a real soft spot for Whittlesey because we've talked about him before and since that he suffered with PTSD and in the end he committed suicide. Do you actually get into that in the film? Yeah, we do. I mean, that's really what his storyline drives to. I have a soft spot for Whittlesey. I'm not sure how you couldn't. So the hope is that when viewers watch, they start to feel a little bit of the pressure he's under and it won't stop. And I bet by the end, before he commits suicide, people are going to sense that's what's going to happen and they're going to feel a little heartbroken about that. 
we definitely deal with what happens with Whittlesey and Damon Runyon after the war, but we really go into the battle and what they experienced because there is what happens after, but there is the actual trauma. When you mention PTSD, you can't read up or listen to or watch anything about the Lost Battalion without realizing every single person there, including Whittlesey, must have experienced some kind of post-traumatic stress or some kind of traumatic distress. You get this double combination of some of the most intense trauma a human can experience combined with what happens after war, which is kind of a media trauma or a social trauma that happens to him and continues to happen. And one really interesting thing that viewers or listeners might not be aware of is how Damon Runyon's life is completely different after the war. It's really fascinating that you have this trajectory of Whittlesey's life going in one direction and Damon Runyon, who is just reporting on it, going in a completely different direction. Where and how can we see the documentary? Our website, echofilmsproductions.com, and there'll be information there. And you should be able to, for a small fee, rent it from there. And it's an hour-long show. That's where you can see it now. Perfect, gentlemen. Well, I really, really look forward to seeing it. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Taylor. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Mark Fastozo, John King, and Louis Blandon are the producers behind the new documentary about the Lost Battalion. Learn more at the links in the podcast notes. This week on World War I War Tech, pigeons. Now, let's face it, pigeons are everywhere. Now, although they annoy some people, I've loved them since I was a kid. Feeding them in the cities when we lived in Europe, I had a special affinity for the one that bombed my mom walking elegantly down the Champs-Élysées wearing a big stylish 50s black hat. Splot. <laughs> and then we moved to Asia, to Hong Kong in the late 50s, and I learned that they were kind of tasty. <laughs> well, everybody has pigeon stories, and so does World War I. But before we dig into the history, here are some remarkable pigeon facts. Pigeons can fly 60 miles an hour and cover 700 miles in a single day. That's pretty good. Homing pigeons can sense the Earth's magnetic field and use it to find their way home from pretty much anywhere. Now, pigeons are one of six species of animals that can recognize themselves in a mirror. I didn't know that. And pigeons can be trained to recognize every letter in the alphabet. Bottom line, pigeons are smart, have skills, and they're pretty much all around amazing. And I apologize to the ones that I ate. Using pigeons as message carriers goes way back. According to journalist and pigeon expert Andrew Bleckman, people have revered pigeons for 10,000 years, and nearly every significant past civilization utilized pigeons for communications, including the ancient Greeks, Romans, Persians, and Chinese. Genghis Khan and the Mongols used them to communicate across the largest land empire in history. So, Blackman sums up the history of humans and pigeons with, It was a pigeon that delivered the results of the first Olympics in 776 BC. And it was a pigeon that first brought news of Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo more than 2,500 years later. Another piece of history. During the Franco-Prussian War, pigeons carried messages from an encircled Paris to unoccupied France establishing the general principle that carrier pigeons make communications possible in the direst of circumstances. According to the Smithsonian's Mike Dash, pigeons have a lot to recommend them in wartime. They eat very little, they're easy to transport, and betray nothing of their point of origin or their destination. You can't really torture a pigeon into talking. For World War I, pigeons flew fast with dogged determination through remarkably dangerous skies. The speedy pigeon was absolutely crucial to communications on the battlefield, especially for advancing troops who didn't have access to more established forms of communications. And apropos to today's show theme, units that had been cut off from the rest of the army. Which brings us to Cher Ami, a pigeon credited with helping to save the 194 survivors of the Lost Battalion. Now, according to the lore, Cher Ami was the last pigeon in the coop as the 77th was being battered by friendly fire. Cher Ami was sent bearing a desperate message to hold fire, suffering several wounds flying through a maelstrom of shrapnel and gunfire. Although Lost Battalion Mythbusters will tell you that first word about friendly fire on the 77th location got back to headquarters just a few minutes before Cher Ami arrived, 
By the time the gallant bird made it back behind American lines, he or she, and I've heard both, had lost an eye, been wounded in the breast, and had one leg attached by literally a thread, the same leg with the message container. Now, first word to stop shelling them or not. Grateful soldiers fit a cher ami with a wooden leg, and the pigeon received the French croix de guerre for bravery. Cher died in 1919 as possibly the most decorated pigeon in history. You can visit Cher today when you go to the Smithsonian in Washington, perched next to fellow World War I hero Sergeant Stubby. Pigeons, this week's World War I war tech. In articles and posts where we highlight the stories you'll find in our weekly newsletter, The Dispatch. Headline, National History Day launches Who They Were program for U.S. World War I Centennial Commission. National History Day, a partner to the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission, announced the launch of Who They Were, a program that mobilizes students and educators across the country to learn about the community's World War I story and to participate in local centennial observations. Educators and students can participate into the summer of 2019. Headline, Task and Purpose. Writing on the Task and Purpose Veterans News website, Jeff Shogel asks why, 100 years after World War I, a national memorial in Washington remains unfinished. Headline, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base Remembers World War I. On Friday, September 21st, the National Museum of the Air Force at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Dayton, Ohio, hosted a dedication ceremony for the new World War I Airmen Memorial. This 100 Cities, 100 Memorials project was dedicated in conjunction with a weekend of World War I activities and took place on the centennial of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. Headline, Young Reader Assesses World War I Literature. Braden Turnage, age 7, of Ashland, Ohio, got interested in World War I this summer when he went to a presentation about the memorial. Then he found out that the Red Baron was real and not just a Snoopy character. Now, an avid reader, Braden has read several books about World War I that he found in his school library and on Amazon.com. In an interview with a young guy born almost a century after, we asked Braden about what aspects of World War I history interested him the most. Finally, our selection from our official World War I Centennial merchandise shop. Our featured item this week is our Bells of Peace commemorative coin. This coin was created to mark the centennial commemoration of Armistice Day, November 11, 1918, when the fighting ended in Europe. The design showcases the iconic American Doughboy and the Bells of Peace logo. A link to our merchandise shop and all the articles we've highlighted here are in our weekly dispatch newsletter. Subscribe at www.cc.org slash subscribe or follow the link in the podcast notes. And that brings us to the buzz. The centennial of World War I this week in social media with Catherine Akey. Catherine, what posts did you pick this week? This week, the Associated Press published an article titled 40 World War I Soldiers Killed on the Same Day in 1918 to be Honored. The article highlights the recent commemoration in the Hudson Valley centered around the 40 Orange County residents who served in companies E and L of the 107th Regiment of the Army's 27th Infantry Division. These 40 men lost their lives all together on September 29, 1918, when Allied forces breached the Hindenburg Line in northern France. Read the article and learn more about the 27th Infantry at the links in the podcast notes. Last for the week, something pretty exciting. The Imperial War Museum recently published a new trailer for Peter Jackson's film, They Shall Not Grow Old. This new film uses original footage from the Imperial War Museum's archive, much of it previously unseen, along with BBC and Imperial War Museum interviews with servicemen who fought in the conflict. The footage has been colorized, converted to 3D, and transformed with modern production techniques to present never-before-seen detail. Follow the link in the podcast notes to see the trailer for yourself and to learn how, where, and when you may be able to watch the film. That's it for the buzz this week. And that wraps up episode number 92 of the award-winning World War I Centennial News Podcast. Thank you for listening. 
We want to thank our guests, Dr. Edward Lengel, military historian and author, Rob Laplander, author, citizen historian, and driving force behind Doughboy MIA, Mike Schuster, curator for the Great War Project blog, Dr. Tom Jackson, executive director of the Georgia World War I Centennial Commission, Mark Foster, grandson of World War I veteran John Foster, Dr. Eric Villard, digital historian at the U.S. Army Center for Military History. Mark Festozo and John King, two of the producers of the new documentary titled The Lost Battalion. Catherine Akey, World War I photography specialist and line producer for the podcast. Many thanks to Mac Nelson and Tim Crow, our interview editing team. To J.L. Michaud for his research. To Rachel Hurt, our fall intern. And I'm Teo Mayer, your producer and host. The U.S. World War I Centennial Commission was created by Congress to honor, commemorate, and educate about World War I. Our programs are to inspire a national conversation and awareness about World War I, including this podcast. We're bringing the lessons of 100 years ago to today's educators and their classrooms. We're helping to restore World War I memorials in communities of all sizes across the country. And of course, we're building America's national World War I memorial in Washington, D.C., we want to thank the Commission's founding sponsor, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, as well as the Star Foundation for their support. The podcast and a full transcript of the show can be found on our website at www.cc.org. You'll find World War I Centennial News in all the places you get your podcasts and even using your smart speaker by saying, play WW1 Centennial News Podcast. The podcast Twitter handle is at the T-H-E W-W-1 podcast. The commission's Twitter and Instagram handles are both at WW1CC and we're on Facebook at WW1 Centennial. Thank you for joining us. And don't forget to share the stories that you're hearing here today about the war that changed the world. Thank you for joining us. So long.